Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digestion for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. And joining me today for part two of our episode on porcine circovirus type two is Dr. Keem Sigalis. Dr. Sigalis joined us in part one last week to introduce the topic. And today we're going to dive a little bit deeper into PCV2. Have you looked at enough data, Keem, to understand the relationship with parity and maternal antibody volume? Is that a way in which we could differentiate and say, okay, guilt litters get vaccinated at this timing and sow litters get vaccinated at a different timing? This may be reflective of some inherent traits with the maternal antibodies from those two different types of mothers. Well, in our experience, what we have seen, because uh, at least in Spain and might be in the U.S., it, it happens similarly, Mm, guilt vaccination is very typical during the acclimatization period. So from this point of view, uh, in general terms, your gills have a relatively solid herd immunity in general terms. However, if the sows are not vaccinated further, then of course uh, you have to rely on the natural infection in terms of the levels of uh, immunity of those animals. And then is when you perceive that there's a, a huge variability. In fact, I would challenge our audience here and say, hey, have you ever tried to monitor serologically your cells and see which are the levels at, at different parity numbers? And I'm pretty sure that a significant number of farms, you will see that there's a, a, an important variation, even within the same parity group. So we have seen at the very end, in those vaccinating uh, gills, high levels of antibodies at the first parity, while the others are much more variable, but in the ones that they are not vaccinating gills, we have seen all the opposite. Almost no immunity in the gills, while there's significant immunity, even variable in the, the rest of breeding stock. So from this point of view, I believe that we have very good options. And here, serology, even serology is not a diagnostic tool, it's an analytical tool. It allows you to monitor, to know where you are from at least antibody levels in terms of immunity. And I believe it's something that we are not using too often. Even people believe, no, but this doesn't allow me diagnosing anything. It's not a matter of diagnosing anything. It's a matter of monitoring the infection. I believe that PCV2 is always following PERS virus. With PERS virus, if you look at nowadays, everybody has a clear idea. We have to monitor, we have to sequence, we have to follow up what's going on. We have to establish epidemiological relationships, etc. Of course, PCV2 is not such a problem like PERS virus, but from the point of view of understanding what's going on in terms of dust infection, the principles are almost the same. Yeah. So I think if I'm hearing you right, Keem, understand the epidemiology of the disease transmission, the infection pattern in your flow. And we have tools to do that. We have diagnostic assays to understand infection with PCR, and as serology to get the data analytics to understand the volume of colostrum likely produced on, on different parities, different farms, and don't over apply that information. Don't assume because you did that within one flow in your system that that's going to be matched at every sow source that you have because your, your guilt management programs, your acclimation, your sow vaccination, it could be different. And as a result, we should expect to have to tailor the timing of the vaccination the number of doses to each farm based on its epidemiology. Is that fair? Absolutely. This is a really good summary of, of the point because at the very end, we always say each farm is an individual world, is completely different, and we have the big abilities of uh, monitoring at all levels, at serological level, at the virus level, et cetera, and of course at the clinical level because then there's another issue that it comes along with uh, the especially the, with the use of PCR and things like that, because a number of veterinarians always ask, hey, how can I monitor the efficacy of the vaccination? Which is the threshold by PCR that I should have in order to be sure that the, the, the vaccine is efficacy? My answer is always, well, I, I would never expect that PCR tells you if your vaccine is efficacious. Look at the pigs. The point is, do you have to look at the pigs? And eventually, might be you have to weight the pigs and see if the average daily weight gain is the according one, that your mortality levels are the according one or the expected ones, etc. But sometimes we have over-expectations with laboratory techniques. 
we believe that they will provide certain information that we have to generate ourselves with our clinical eye, with our investigations at a clinical level. And this is another very important point. So we should rely much more on the clinical abilities of the veterinarian. Sometimes we are relying, not looking at the pigs, but looking at the results of the sera or the uh, oral fluid or whatever. It's, 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 it's an important point, I believe. The, the laboratory will tell us what's going on with the specific subpopulation of samples we sent them, right? The 30 animals that we took serum from or the two animals we euthanized and took tissues from. But the lab doesn't see the thousands of other pigs in that population. And I think that's a wonderful point that you have to be open to the fact that, yes, maybe you have PCVAD, right? P PCV associated disease in a sub portion of your population. And that may or may not be acceptable. But the severity of that issue has a lot to do with the prevalence of the pigs that look like that, right? The pig never lies. And if the pig tells you that they have PCV associated disease, well, they do. Is that 1%? Is that 10%? Is that 0.1%? your intervention will likely vary based on that severity. Oh, absolutely. And then there's another point here, because sometimes when you have problems, you get very nervous. And when somebody gets nervous, of course, instead of designing uh, a logical approach to the problem, sometimes the easiest thing is change your vaccination or stop something on, etc. And this is something that it's important to me that we have to use our head and our knowledge, because nowadays we have the knowledge for that, said, okay, let's see what's going on and don't change something suddenly without any control because the major problem, and I know how difficult it is under field conditions to do certain issues because we have had cases in which they phone me, Kim, we have a problem, we believe that the vaccine doesn't work, etc. What do you, would you do? And always said, okay, I'm not so sure if it's a vaccine or not, but uh, if you want to change your vaccine, why don't you keep half of your animals vaccinated with your current vaccine and the other half with the other one and then monitor them and compare. And then at the very end, they told me, Kim, well, already, we, we changed already. Damn it, then why do you call me? Because uh, this doesn't this look well. You, you don't have any control because if your new vaccine works, I'm pretty sure that you have changed many other things as well. And you never know if you can attribute to the effect of the vaccination or just the effect of the different management or, or changing people or whatever that you have performed in your farm already. Changing season, changing purse status, all of those things. I mean, I think uh, I think you hit on a very important point there, Keen. We as veterinarians and producers often look for a solution in a new bottle. And I, I'm going to make a statement here and you feel free to disagree with it. I think if you just change, if you're having a problem with circovirus and you just change the brand of vaccine, you don't change anything else you're probably still going to have that problem, right? Um, you're probably better off looking at a better timing, even if you change the product, right? Change the product if you feel like you need to, but you probably need to look at timing, co-infection, and some other things if you truly want to reduce the pressure. Because just switching what bottles you're using, that's not changing, that's not, a, that's not applying what you know of the epidemiology of the disease. That's just a random, okay, we're going to try something else. And there's really not a lot of evidence to suggest that we have bad circo vaccine options. Well, th that's a point because, and especially with the multifactorial diseases, because if you have a new unifactorial disease in which just the pathogen, it's the, the one that will trigger disease or not, might be, could be different. But in those multifactorial diseases in which there are many issues uh, related with them, vaccine is one of the important factors to control the problem, but it's not the only one. One of the issues that we experience as well uh, here in Spain in a very clear cut form is that once we started applying the vaccines and we observed that PCV2 vaccines work so well, everybody started relaxing about co-infections, about management practices, about biosecurity, about et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes those very good products that might be coming to the market every 20 or 30 years, et cetera, sometimes are very good for uh, approaching one given problem, but these attend other important issues which are really important, not just for PCV2, but for many other diseases as well. And, and we, we have to be very careful on that. And especially nowadays with the advent of the highly pathogenic PERS virus strains, biosecurity is a still, and I mean internal and, bios and external biosecurity, are absolutely key issues to try to control disease and to avoid co-infections and to have a good production flow. This is compulsory. So the, the solution in the syringe or in the bottle, well, 
never believe in somebody that sells you the, the solutions in just based on the bottle. It will not work. Or it will work for a period of time, but it's not the solution, really. Yeah, and if it is the solution, it changes the epidemiology, uh, epidemiology of the disease, and we may have to update the plan to get the same solution. Correct, correct. And at the very end, I, and I believe as veterinarians, we have to be flexible because sometimes we believe, oh, I'm vaccinating in something, so it's impossible that this will be the problem. Well, analyze the problem. This is not uh, a major issue. And I believe nowadays, as we discussed before, we have the tools. So as long as you have the tools and you can work with those tools and you know how to interpret those tools, be open-minded. Uh, I'm vaccinating in something. I expect not major impact, at least, for, for example, with PCV2. But if it's a PCV2 problem, then you, you have elements for reacting. It's not a major problem, really. Even, of course, for the farmer, he's not very happy when something like that occurs, of course. Oh, yeah. Most of our uh, most important lessons, unfortunately, are learned painfully. Um, but as long as we make improvements, they're well worth the, the pain we go through to learn them. Um, Dr. Sagales, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to the day where we can uh, do this in person in the very near future. I uh, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much, Clayton. It has been a real pleasure, always a pleasure to, to chat with you. And, and certainly it would be very nice to do it in real time, in person, in there. But sooner or later it will happen, I'm sure. Thank you, Dr. Sigalis, for coming on the show. And to everybody else, thank you very much for listening to the Swine Health Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinehealthblackbelt.com if you haven't already. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on a new episode next week. Thanks, everybody, for listening in. Have a great rest of your day. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health-related research trial and would like to come on the show to talk about it with me and share it with our audience, feel free to send an email to healthblackbelt at swineit.com, and we would love to take a look at your research.